our studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, California. This is a CUBE Conversation. Hello and welcome to CUBE Conversations. I'm James Kobielus, lead analyst at Wikibon. Today we've got an excellent guest and who's a CUBE alumnus par excellence. It's Yaron Haviv, who is the founder and uh, CTO of Iguazio. Hello, Yaron, welcome in. I think you're, you're coming in from Tel Aviv, if I'm not mistaken. Right, pretty close to Tel Aviv, thanks. Uh, Jim, and nice seeing you again. Yeah, nice to see you again. So I'm here in our Palo Alto studios, and so I'm always excited when I can hear your own and meet with your own because he always has something interesting and new to share about what they're doing in the areas of cloud and serverless and real-time streaming analytics and now uh, data science. I wasn't aware of how deeply they're involved in the whole data science pipeline. So. Yaron, this is great to have you. So my first question really is, um, can you sketch out what are the, the emerging marketplace requirements that you at Iguazio are seeing in the convergence of all these spaces, uh, especially real-time streaming analytics, edge computing, serverless, and data science, and AI. Can you give us a sort of a, a broad perspective and outlook on the convergence and really the new opportunities or possibilities that the convergence of those technologies uh, enable for enterprises that are making deep investments? Yeah, so, so I think we've sort of anticipated what's happening now, we just called it a different name and we'll probably get into, into this discussion in, in a minute. Uh, I think what you see is that traditional analytics and even data scientists, uh, science was starting at sort of uh, research labs, you know, people exploring cancer, exploring, uh, you know, impact of weather on, you know, people's mood, et cetera. And, and now people are trying to make real ROI from uh, AI and data science. So they have to plug it within business applications. Okay, so it's not just a data scientist sitting in a silo, you know, with a bunch of uh, logs that he got from his friends, the data engineer, and, and he scans them and generates some namesakes and runs to the boss and says, you know what, you know, we, we could have made some money, you know, a year ago if we've done something. So that doesn't make a lot of impact on the business. Where the impact on the business uh, is happening is when you actually integrate AI in chatbots, in uh, recommendation engines, in in doing predictive analytics on analyzing failures and and saving saving those failures on you know saving people's life and those kind of use cases those are the ones that require a tighter integration between the application, uh, the data, and the algorithms that come from the, the AI and and that's where where we started. If you think about our platform, we, we worked on the real-time data, which is where, you know, when you're going into more production environment and not data lakes, you need a uh, very good, very fast integration with data. And we had this sort of uh, fast computation layer, which was day one uh, microservices. And, you know, now everyone talks about microservices. We certainly, uh, certainly started with this area. And that is allowing people to build those intelligent applications that are integrated into the business applications. And, and the biggest challenges I see today for organizations is moving from this process of doing some research on, on data, you know, historical data, and translating that into a business application or into impact on business application. This is where people can spend a year. You know, I've seen a tweet saying, we've built a machine learning model in like a few weeks, and now we've waited 11 months for the productization of that artifact. Yes, that's what we're seeing at Wikibon, which is that AI is the heart of modern applications in business. And the new generation of application developers in many ways are data scientists or have you know, leverage the skills and tools for data science. Now looking at Iguazio's portfolio, you, you evolve so rapidly and to address a broader range of use cases. Um, I've seen, and you've explained it over the years that and positioned Iguazio as being a, a continuous data platform, an intelligent edge platform, a serverless platform. And now I see that you're a bit of a data science workbench or pipeline tooling platform. Can you connect these dots your own and explain what is Iguazio's well, portfolio? They're all, they're all uh, nice marketing for the same technology that we've built. Okay, just over the years, you know, people, uh, four years when we started, so we had to call it something else. People at that time thought that analytics sort of incorporates data science. And when we said continuous analytics, we meant essentially feeding data in, running some algorithms, spitting some results. Uh, this is was sort of opposed to the trend of Hadoop, 
which was a data lake. I mean, you throw data in, and then you run the batch, uh, batch analytics, and then like a uh, few days later, you have some insights. So continuous analytics was sort of a term that we have uh, came up with, maybe not the best, you know, uh, you know, describe that you're essentially taking data in from different sources, uh, crunching it through algorithms, and generating triggers and actions or response to user requests, okay? Uh, and that was sort of a pretty uh, unique and, and um, sort of uh, pioneering this industry, even before they called it streaming or, you know, real-time data science or, or whatever. Uh, now, if you look at our architecture, our architecture, as I explained before, is comprised of three components. The first component is a real-time multi-model database. You know, you know about it. Pretty exceptional in its performance and its other capabilities. Uh, the second thing is a microservice engine that allows us to essentially inject applications of various kinds. Initially, we started with applications that essentially do analytics. You know, grouping, joining, you know, correlating. And then we started just adding more functions and do other things like inferencing, uh, image recognition, sentiment analysis, et cetera. Because we have this function engine, it allows us a lot of flexibility and tying the uh, really fast parallel engine on a really fast data can, can generate remarkable results. And then the industry started calling this, this microservice thing a serverless. We sort of even were ahead of the game of this serverless gang. Uh, the third element of our platform is essentially having a fully managed pass, uh, a platform where all those microservices and data manage through a self-service interface, sort of think of it as a mini cloud. Uh, and now, you know, we've uh, recently, in the last two years, we've uh, shifted to working with Kubernetes versus using our own uh, proprietary microservices orchestration originally. So we have went into all those three uh, major technologies. Now those fit into different application one of the very interesting application, if you think about Edge, in the Edge, you need to serve a mini cloud. You need a variety of data sources and, and databases with, you know, columnar, rows, streaming, you know, files, et cetera. We all support all of them on our integrated uh, platform. And then you need those uh, microservices that could be developed in the cloud and then just sort of shift into the enforcement point in the Edge. And you need sort of an orchestration layer because you want to do software upgrades, you need to protect security. So uh, having all the integrated stack created an opportunity for us to work with uh, providers of Edge. And you may have noticed our joint announcement with Google around solution for Edge uh, around retailers and, and IoT. Uh, we've made some announcement with Microsoft in the past. We're going to do some very interesting announcement uh, very soon. Uh, we've made some joint announcements with Samsung and Nvidia all around uh, those areas. We continue, it's not that we're limited to Edge, just that what happens because we have extremely high density data platform, mm. very power efficient, very well integrated, it has a great fit in the in the edge. But it's also the same platform that we sell in the cloud as a service, uh, or we sell to on-prem customers, uh, so they can run the same things. Just in the cloud, it sort of happens to be the fastest, most uh, real-time platform, uh, and in the edge, it's sort of an essential uh, feature that you, you cannot just ignore. So you're wrong, you're, yeah, Iguazio is a complete cloud native development and runtime platform. Now serverless in many ways seems to be the core of your capability in your platform, Nucleo, uh, which uh, is your technology, you've open sourced it, it's uh, built for prem-based and private clouds, but also it has, it's extensible to be usable in broader hybrid cloud uh, scenarios. Now, uh, give us a sense for how Nucleo and serverless functions become valuable or useful for data science or uh, for, for executing services or functions of data of the data science pipeline. Can, can you connect the dots of Nucleo and data science and AI for, from the development standpoint? So, sure, sure. So, so um, I, I think, you know, the two pillars that we have as technology, the, the most important ones are the data. You know, we have about, I think like 12 patents on our data engine, uh, which is very uh, high performance and Nucleo functions. And, and also they're very well integrated because usually serverless is stateless. So, you know, you, you end up, uh, if you want to run data, you have some challenges uh, with serverless. Uh, with Nucleo, you can actually do stateful uh, use cases. You can mount files, you, you have real-time connections to data. So that makes it a lot more interesting than just uh, Lambda functions. Uh, the other thing with Nucleo is that it's extremely high performance. It has concurrent, it's about 200 times faster than Lambda. So that means that 
you can actually go and build things like a stream processing engine, you know, do joins in real time of variety of database uh, activities. You can just go and do collectors, we call them, those like things that go fetch information from weather services, from uh, routers for, for doing cybersecurity analysis, from uh, all sorts of sensors. So those functions are becoming like, you know, those nanobots, you know, in the analogy of, uh, of those uh, movies, is that you just send them over to go and do things for you, like uh, whether it's the, the data collection and, and uh, crunching, uh, whether it's the inferencing engines, those things that, for example, get a picture, compare it with the model, decide what's in the picture, uh, and that, this is where uh, Nokia really comes into play. The interesting point, you see now an emergence of a serverless pattern in data science. So there are many companies that do like model inferencing as a service. Uh, essentially what they do, they launch a, an endpoint, a URL endpoint that sort of uh, runs the model inside. You send a vector of numeric values and you get back a numeric values and they conversion that. It's not really different than serverless. It's just way more limited because I don't just want to send a vector of you know, numbers because uh, usually I, I need to send real data, like a geolocation of my uh, cell phone with some user ID, and I need this function to cross-correlate it with other information about myself uh, with the geolocation and then give me a recommendation of which uh, product I need to buy. So, uh, And then those functions also have all sorts of dependencies on, on different packages, different software, environment variables, you know, build instructions. All those, this is really where uh, serverless technologies are much more suitable. Now, it's interesting that if you'll go to Amazon, they have a, a product called SageMaker, I'm sure you're familiar with yes. that, which is their data science platform, okay? Now, SageMaker, although you, you would say that's ideal use case for uh, Amazon Lambda functions, they actually don't use Amazon Lambda functions in SageMaker. Mm. And you would ask yourself, why aren't they using uh, Lambda functions in SageMaker? Just sort of telling you, you know, you could use Lambda as a glue logic around SageMaker. And that's because because Lambda doesn't fit the use case, okay? Because Lambda uh, doesn't uh, is not capable of storing large uh, content, and machine learning models could be hundreds of megabytes in core. Lambda is extremely slow, so you cannot do high concurrency uh, inferencing with uh, with Lambda functions. So they essentially had to create another serverless and call it with a different name. Although if they just would have approved Lambda, maybe it was it was more of a Swiss Army. Okay? So with Nuclear, we've, took it, we've taken the other approach. We, we don't have the amount of resources that the Amazon have. Mm. So we created one serverless engine, one serverless engine that does batch processing, stream processing, can store lots of data, even run continuous services. So all the different computation pattern with a single uh, engine. And, and then sort of you've started seeing all this trend in data science about, yeah, we need to version our code. We need to, you know, uh, record all our package dependencies and all those things. Yes, serverless does it. So we we just had to uh, go and tie it more into the existing frameworks. Uh, and you've uh, looked at our uh, project. We have a project called Nucleo Jupiter, which is essentially a data scientist can write some code in his data science notebook, and then he clicks uh, one command called Nucleo Deploy. It automatically compiles his data science artifacts, mm -hmm. notebooks, etc., and converts it into a real-time function that can listen not only on HTTP, then it can listen on streams. It could be scheduled on, on, on various timing. It could do batch and do so many other things. So, and the interesting point is that if you think about data scientists, they're not the best programmers because they should be the best scientists. Okay? And, and this is, that means that they actually have a bigger barrier to writing code. Mm -hmm. So if you, it's a serverless framework. That no, also you, automates the logging, the auto scaling, the security, the provisioning of data, the versioning of everything, and package dependencies. If they just need to focus on writing algorithms, it's actually a bigger bang for the buck. Now, if you just take serverless into DevOps teams, and they will tell you, yeah, you know, we know how to instrument Docker, we know how to do all those things. So the value in their eyes is smaller than the value in the eyes of data scientists. So that's why we're actually seeing this appeal that. Uh, those those people that essentially uh, focus in life is writing math and algorithms and all sorts of those sophisticated things. They, they don't want to deal with coding and maintenance and operations. And by also doing so, by operationalizing their code through serverless, you can cut time to market, you can address scalability, you avoid rewriting of code, all those big challenges that organizations are facing. 
you run, I have to ask, yeah, that's great. Um, you have the tools to build, uh, uh, to help customers build serverless functions for AI and so forth inside of Jupyter Notebooks. And you mentioned SageMaker, which is an AWS uh, solution, which is up and coming in terms of supporting a full data science uh, tool chain uh, for pipeline development uh, you know, among teams. Uh, you have more, high more profile partnerships right. with uh, Microsoft and Google and so forth. Do you incorporate or integrate or support uh, either of these cloud providers own data science workbench offerings or third party offerings from, there's dozens of others in this space. Uh, what are you doing in terms yeah. of partnerships in that area? Yeah. Obviously, we don't want to lock us out from any of those. And you know, if someone already has his workbench, then I don't want my customers say, "Yeah, you're locking me into your uh, your own workbench." Uh, in our workbench, the things are really cool because, uh, like, our Jupyter is connected through real-time connections to the database, and it has sort of other uh, cool features that um, essentially you're getting like a huge uh, a speed boost. We have we've done some tricks that we've announced with Nvidia around methods and integration with GPUs, like creating a pool of GPUs that from each of one of the data scientists uh, running on a platform can essentially launch jobs on this pool of CPUs and of owning the GPUs, which are extremely expensive, as you know. But uh, what we've done is because of all of our uh, technology beside the actual database engine is open source, uh, we can essentially just go and install packages and we've demonstrated that to Google and Azure and the others we can essentially get, just go and load a bunch of packages into their workbench mm -hmm. and uh, make it very close to what we provide in our managed platform, you know, not with the same performance levels, but functionality-wise, uh, the same functionality. Hmm. So how, uh, can you name some reference customers that are using Iguazio inside of high-performance data science workflows? Um, is, uh, are you, or are you just testing the waters in that market for your technology? Your technology is already fairly mature. So, so as I told you before, although we, you know, we sort of change messaging along the lines, we always did the same thing. So when we, we did continuous analytics and we've spoken like a year and two ago, about some of the use cases that we, we run, like you know, telco operators that are running real time, uh, you know, health uh, predictive, uh, health monitoring of their networks and auto healing networks and those kind of things. They all use uh, algorithms to control those those operations. We, we work with ride hailing customers, so we can feed a lot of uh, data, generate real time maps, and, and do uh, fraud detection and, and other applications on, on all those things. So uh, we've noticed that all of the use cases that we're working with involve data science. Uh, in some cases, by the way, because of sort of politics, the We've, once we've said we have analytics or continuous analytics, we were sort of sent into, sent into the analytics with, with the organization, which were more focused on sort of uh, data warehousing, because analytics is still sort of data warehousing and a do. And uh, the actual people that build applications, sort of those data science applications and, and sort of real time AI or incorporating AI into business applications are more the development and business people. This is also why we sort of changed our our naming because we wanted to make it very clear that where our technology is about building new applications, it's not about data warehousing or faster queries on a data warehousing. It's about generating value to the business. Now, uh, if you ask about specific application, we just announced uh, a few weeks ago uh, the investment of Samsung in Iguazio. Mm -hmm. uh, part of that in, it essentially has two pillars beyond getting a few million dollars. It's a, uh, one thing is that they've adopted Nucleo as, as their uh, serverless for their internal clouds. And the second one is we're working with them on a bunch of uh, data science uh, uh, use cases. Uh, one of them I think was even quoted in the in the NAT we made with NB. So there are also no what, we can, what I can say or not say, but essentially those are real business applications. Three, at least three of those uh, that involves you know in, in intercepting data from users and customers doing real-time analytics and responding uh, really quickly. But one of the things that we've announced is because of the use of Nucleo and some tricks that we've done with Nvidia, we actually quadrupled their performance. Uh, Yaron, do you see a, of, uh, a yeah? Do you see a fair number of customers uh, uh, embedding machine learning inside of? real-time streaming, stream computing backbones. This is the week of Flink Forward here in San, San Francisco. I, I was at the event earlier this week and I, I saw, the, uh, at least they're uh, presenting a fair amount of uptake 
of ML inside of stream computing. Do you see that as being a coming ma mainstream best practice? Um, <laughs> streaming is still in the analytics bucket, okay? Yeah. Uh, because uh, what we're looking for is applications which are more interactive. You know, if you think about like the like a chatbot or like doing a predictive analytics, it's not about streaming because streaming is still, you know, it's faster flow of data, but it still sort of has delay associated. It's not responsive. It's not, you know, it's not uh, the, the aspect of latency is less critical in streaming. Okay, the aspect of throughput is, is higher on streaming, but not necessarily the response time. You know, think about Spark streaming. You know, it's good at processing a lot of data. It's definitely not good at respond. No one would put uh, Spark as a way to respond to user uh, request on the internet. Okay, uh, so we're doing streaming, and we see the growth. But I think where we see the real growth is uh, embedding it to real applications, the ones when a customer logs in and sends a request, or uh, you know, working with telcos on scenarios where uh, technicians have like RFID on, on their tracks and they send all, all sorts of information on, on real time inventory. And then a customer calls and says, I need you know, a set of box. And they could say, you know, this guy needs to go all the way to that customer because how many times you gotten a technician coming to your house and said, no, I don't have that well, exactly. You know, and then they had to send a different guy. So the idea is how do you impact the business on three pillars of the business? Okay, the three pillars are uh, one is uh, essentially improving your operation or reducing the risk. Is essentially reducing your your cost aspect. Uh, the other one is essentially how do you uh, grab more customers or make customers more successful. So this is around front end application. You know, uh, whether it's bots or uh, or doing uh, you know targeted marketing uh, or those kind of uh, use cases. And, and also how do you grow your market, which is uh, again around recommendation engines and and those kinds of things. So uh, all those things, if you, if you want to have AI incorporated in your business applications in a few years, you're probably going to be dead. Uh, I don't see any business that could sustain competition uh, without in incorporating sort of the ability to integrate real, real data uh, with some uh, customer data and essentially go and react based on that. To change the subject slightly, uh, you mentioned NVIDIA as a partner recently, of course, you announced that uh, a few weeks ago at their event. And they've, they've recently acquired Mellanox, and I believe you, you used to be with Mellanox, so I'd like to get your commentary on, on that acquisition or merger. Uh, right, yeah, so, so I was a, a VP data center at Mellanox. I, my last uh, job, I uh, still have good friends of, of all the, of the guys there, including the, the CEO and the, the rest of the team. Um, we met in Jensen last week. Uh, he was in Israel, so we've uh, we talked to the Nvidia guys as well. I think it's a great uh, merger. Um, if you think about it, Mellanox had uh, has sort of the best networking and storage technology on sort of the silicon side, and Nvidia has sort of the best GPU technologies. Uh, Mellanox also acquired some compute uh, chip uh, technologies, and they also have a very uh, very nice photonics technologies. And Mennonox today is being by all the cloud providers. You know, my previous role was ex essentially owning uh, those technical engagements uh, with like the Azures and you know the rest of the, the gang. So uh, now Nvidia coming with the computation engine and and Mellanox coming with sort of the rest of the pieces around storage and networking make them a very strong uh, player. And I think it sort of threatens Intel because if you think about Intel, they haven't really managed to come with. Uh, high-speed networking recently, they haven't really managed to come with GPUs that sort of combat NVIDIA technology. Uh, so I think that makes uh, NVIDIA sort of uh, a pretty uh, strong, uh, you know, uh, vendor in that space. Yeah, and another question is not related to that, but you're in uh, Tel Aviv, Israel, and of course Israel is famous for uh, the, the startups in the areas of machine learning and so, especially with a focus on cybersecurity. I think Israel is like, near the top of the world in yeah. terms of just the amount of brain power focused on cybersecurity there. What are the hot ML machine learning related developments or innovations you see coming out of Israel uh, recently related to cybersecurity and distributed cloud environments? Uh, anything uh, in terms of just basic R&D technology that we should all be aware of that will be finding its way into mainstream cloud and Kubernetes and serverless environments going forward? Your thoughts? 
<laughs> yes, I, I think there are different areas. Of, you know, the guys in Israel also look at what happens in in the sorry the U.S. and there are players in all the different things. I, I think what what's unique about us as a small country is that it's always trying to think outside of the box because we know we cannot compete in a very large market if we don't have innovation. So that sort of triggers this sort of uh, of innovation uh, part. Uh, because of all the security aspects in the country, then also there's a lot of cyber. But, um, you know, some of the things I've seen, one cool startup that's also backed by our VC is doing sort of uh, Think about like face unrecognition, uh, pretty cool technology of since they could take a picture and make it uh, such that, uh, you know, you uh, machine learning will not be able to recognize recognize that, mm. sort of, you know, sort of anti-cyber attack for uh, image recognition. So that's something pretty unique that I've heard, uh, but there are other uh, startups working on all the aspects of uh, DevOps and automation and auto ML and and also cyber, automating cyber security and, you know, various uh, aspects. Right, right. Um, thank you very much, Yaron. This has been an excellent conversation. Um, uh, we've really enjoyed great. hearing your, your comments and Iguazio is a great company, quite, quite an innovator. It's always a pleasure to have you on theCUBE. With that, I'm going to sign off. This is James Kobielus with uh, Wikibon, uh, with uh, Yaron Haviv, and uh, we bid you all have a good day. Thank you.